Well, very good morning to you. Welcome to the York City Church live stream today. It's the 28th of March. My name is Alan Rose, and we're going to go straight into hearing a scripture reading this morning. As soon as it was morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council. They bound Jesus, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate. Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? He answered him, You say so. Then the chief priests accused him of many things. Pilate asked him again, Have you no answer? See how many charges they bring against you. But Jesus made no further reply, so that Pilate was amazed. Now at the festival, he used to release a prisoner for them, anyone for whom they asked. Now a man called Barabbas was in prison with the rebels who had committed murder during the insurrection. So the crowd came and began to ask Pilate to do for them according to his custom. Then he answered them, Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he realised that it was out of jealousy that the chief priests had handed him over. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to have him release Barabbas for them instead. Pilate spoke to them again. Then what do you wish me to do with the man you call the king of the Jews? They shouted back, Crucify him. Pilate asked them, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Crucify him. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released Barabbas for them. And after flogging Jesus, he handed him over to be crucified. Then the soldiers led him into the courtyard of the palace, that is, the governor's headquarters. And they called together the whole cohort. And they clothed him in a purple cloak. And after twisting some thorns into a crown, they put it on him. And they began saluting him. Hail, King of the Jews! They struck his head with a reed, spat upon him, and knelt down in homage to him. After mocking him, they stripped him of the purple cloak and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him out to crucify him. They compelled a passerby who was coming in from the country to carry his cross. It was Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus. Then they brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of a skull. And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him and divided his clothes among them, casting lots to decide what each should take. It was nine o'clock in the morning when they crucified him. The inscription of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. And with him they crucified two bandits, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by derided him, shaking their heads and saying, Aha! You who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests, along with the scribes, were also mocking him among themselves and saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. Let the Messiah, the King of Israel, come down from the cross now, so that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him also taunted him. When it was noon, Darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. At three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lemma sabachthani, which means, 
my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, Listen, he's calling for Elijah. And someone ran, filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a stick, and gave it to him to drink, saying, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. Then Jesus gave a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two, from top to bottom. Now when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, Truly, this man was God's son. There were also women looking on from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, and Mary the mother of James the younger, and of Joses, and Salome. These used to follow him and provided for him when he was in Galilee. And there were many other women who had come up with him to Jerusalem. When evening had come, and since it was the day of preparation, that is, the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the council, who was also himself waiting expectantly for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate wondered if he were already dead, and summoning the centurion, he asked him whether he had been dead for some time. When he learned from the centurion that he was dead, he granted the body to Joseph. Then Joseph bought a linen cloth, and taking down the body, wrapped it in the linen cloth, and laid it in a tomb that had been hewn out of the rock. He then rolled a stone against the door of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of Joseph saw where the body was laid. So what can we say then about this remarkable chapter from Mark's Gospel? Well, I'd like to begin this morning by highlighting for you that there are seven royal ascriptions in chapter 15 of Mark. Seven times the phrase King of the Jews, King of Israel, or Son of God, which is a royal ascription, are used of Jesus. In fact, Mark's gospel as a whole begins with an announcement that it is the good news of the Son of God, which means the King. And throughout Mark's gospel, we see Jesus acting in such a way that shows that he is the true king, before it arrives at a dramatic conclusion where Jesus' kingship is displayed most fully at the cross. Now, what makes Mark 15 so staggeringly profound is that throughout Mark's gospel, he shows us that Jesus is not just a Messiah, a kingly figure, but he is also the embodiment of Yahweh, the Lord God of Israel. And so in the person of Jesus, we are seeing kingship and divinity coming together and cohering in this one man, Jesus of Nazareth. And then at the cross, we get to see most clearly and profoundly just what it means for Jesus to be God and King. Now, to help us grasp better what is going on in Mark 15 and to help us to grasp this concept I'd like to walk you through Mark 15 in the time that we have left this morning and highlight in particular five ironies that Mark portrays. Five ironies that allow us to better understand what it means for Jesus to be both God and King. And so the first irony is that the one who is utterly powerless is actually all-powerful. In the build-up to Mark 15, we get to see Jesus performing great wonders. Uh, he forgives sins, he casts out demons, he commands creation uh, and still storms. Uh, Jesus is a man who is powerful. He demonstrates Yahweh's power uh, in his own words. He doesn't appeal to God elsewhere, he just does the things that God does. 
We also get to see Jesus in chapters 8, 9, and 10 of Mark, which are a kind of tipping point in the gospel, redefining what this way of the Lord, what it means for him to be God, how that will look. And we see Jesus three times saying that he is going to Jerusalem and he's going to suffer and die. He's going to be rejected at the hands of the chief priests and he'll be crucified. And his disciples don't understand. And in Mark chapter 10, we find having just announced to them that he's heading to Jerusalem to suffer and die, Mark says that Jesus is walking ahead. So Jesus is boldly going there. He's not shrinking back. He's a man who is in a sense, in control of his destiny. He is consciously enacting the thing that he feels that God has called him to do. This is not someone who is just passively letting stuff happen. He is walking ahead. And then it moves into chapter 14, where we find Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, wrestling with the will of God, wrestling with the horrors of what lies before him, and submitting to God. And so we have Jesus moving from a place of power and control to a place of surrender and humility, surrendering to God. And then we read in chapter 15 that Jesus is brought before Pilate. And in that scene, Jesus has become completely powerless. He is now utterly at the hands, at the mercy, if you like, of Pilate. Pilate asks Jesus, are you the king of of the Jews. And here's the ironic bit in all of this. The question is really a statement, because in written Greek there is no question marks. And so Pilate literally says, you are the king of the Jews. And if we could hear it said, it may have a slant to it, and we might be able to tell that it's a question, but as we read it in Greek, it just says, you are the king of the Jews. And Jesus says, you have said so. And so in this moment of powerlessness, when he is moved from having power and exercising power and authority to surrendering to the Father, to being brought before the scribes and the chief priests and handed over to Pilate, Pilate actually does exactly what Peter does. When Peter says, you are the Christ, the Messiah, that's what Pilate says, you are the king of the Jews. And Jesus says, you've said so, but he says it in this place of powerlessness and weakness, and vulnerability. So the one who is all-powerful is portrayed here as powerless. And in this place of powerlessness, Pilate, in a twist of irony, confesses him to be the king of the Jews. That's the first irony. The second irony is this. The one who is mocked as a false king is really the true king. Having been handed over by Pilate to be crucified, Jesus gets roughed up by a bunch of Roman soldiers. They clothe him in some kind of faux royal garb. They put a purple robe on him and twist together a crown of thorns and place it on his head. And then they bow down in mock homage to him, worshipping effectively and saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And this is a kind of crazy and wonderful scene in Mark 15 because... Although it sounds and reads as being something horrific, what the soldiers are doing turns out weirdly to be the appropriate thing. Because this is precisely the kind of king that Jesus has come to be. He hasn't come to be a king who rides in with a legion of troops and sacks the Romans and wins back his people by a great military conquest. He has come to be the one who in weakness and vulnerability endures suffering and shame. And that's the way that he enters into his kingship. It's a great twist of irony that what is meant to be wounding and caustic is actually the appropriate response to this king. Jesus is the true king. And as he's mocked as a false king, in that moment and in that scene, we get to understand that this is exactly the kind of king that he intended to be all along. This is Jesus in his glory. The third irony in Mark 15 is that the one who is crucified as a failed king is in fact the conquering king. 
Jesus is crucified with two bandits either side of him, as the NRSV translation puts it. The word bandit there translates a Greek term, lestai, which is often translated robbers. And it kind of gives the impression that the people crucified either side of Jesus were uh, the kind of cheeky thieves who had maybe nicked a packet of crisps from Lidl or something. Uh, But really the word is a little bit more intense and a little bit more involved than that. Lestai is a term that referred often to people who were violent insurrectionists. They were men who had risen up violently against the Roman powers and were being crucified as a result of their efforts and as an example to anyone else who thought that they might do the same kind of thing. So Jesus is being crucified in between two violent criminals. The sign above Jesus' head reads, The King of the Jews. And the irony, of course, is that here Jesus is supposed to be seen as this failed king. This is what Rome does to people who try to be kings, who think that they can exercise some kind of authority. And in Mark, what you must understand is that Jesus has already said that whoever is going to, that when he comes into his glory, into his kingdom, To sit at his left and his right has been prepared already. James and John ask him in Mark 10, grant that we can sit at your left hand and your right. And Jesus says, well, it's not really my call. It's for those who it's been prepared. And then we see Jesus on the cross with someone on his left and on his right. And what we're supposed to see here is that this is the royal moment. This is the coronation of Jesus. This is the moment where in Rome, And and in the the scribes' eyes, Jesus is shown to be a failed king. But in Jesus' heart and mind, and in the hearts and minds of those who can notice and understand, this is the moment where Jesus is crowned. He's lifted up. This is his coronation moment. This is the moment of his victory. And so the sign above his head that's meant to be ironic is in fact true. This is the king of the Jews, and this is exactly what it looks like when this king is lifted up and comes into his kingdom. This is Jesus in his glory. The fourth irony, the saviour who cannot save himself can save others. As he's been crucified, those who pass by Jesus mock him and they say, he saved others, he cannot save himself. And they invite Jesus to come down from the cross in order to prove that he is indeed the true king. And yet Jesus' power to save others is based entirely on his willingness to forsake the power to save himself. Jesus could have called on legions of angels. Jesus could have, with a word, transformed the situation. Jesus could have overthrown the Romans and the powers that be with a blink of the eye, and yet he doesn't. He forsakes the power to save himself in order to save others. And the irony, once again, is intended really to wound. Come down from the cross, you could save others, you can't even save yourself. Jesus' helplessness and powerlessness is precisely his power for the salvation of others, for you and for me, for the whole world. You know, when we construct ways, or when we attempt to construct ways of saving ourselves, whether that be through careers or relationships or possessions or emotional blackmail or manipulation or whatever else it might be, not only do we deny the power of the cross as God's means of our forgiveness and salvation, But we also deny that God in Christ has chosen to save through weakness, vulnerability, foolishness, 
and powerlessness. This is Jesus in his glory. Irony number five. God coming down looks like Jesus staying up on the cross. Right near the start of Mark's gospel, if you want to read this later, you, you can. Uh, when Jesus is baptised in the River Jordan, we read that he saw the heavens torn apart. And Mark has borrowed that language from the prophet Isaiah, who in Isaiah 64 prayed a well-known prayer that longed for God to come down, to rend the heavens, to tear apart the heavens, to come down and rescue his people. And now as Jesus hangs dying on the cross, the passers-by, the chief priests, the scribes, even the criminals crucified with him, all call on him to come down from the cross. And again, it's intended to be ironic. Come down from the cross. We will see and we will believe. But the greater irony in this is that they are now using Isaiah's words. They're now using the very prayer Isaiah prayed. Come down to save. And they can't see that the answer to that is right in front of their faces. Now, as if this wasn't profound enough, the moment of Jesus' death is accompanied by the tearing of the curtain in the temple from top to bottom. And the word for tear is the same word that is used for the tearing open of the heavens in Jesus' baptism. The same one, albeit in Hebrew, that Isaiah used when he prayed for God to come down and rescue. And I want to make a suggestion to you that the whole of Mark's gospel climaxing as it does here in chapter 15, really, is an extended reflection on what it means and what it looks like for God to come down and save. God has come down. And the irony is that in the prayer, oh, that you would come down, and in the voices of the mocking passers-by, come down, Jesus has in fact enacted God's coming down. But God has come down to save by staying up on the cross. That is how God comes down to save. That is how God tears apart the heavens. That is how God rescues and delivers. That is how God enters into his kingdom. And so the scriptures turn our expectations and assumptions about God and his kingdom, about power and rule and authority, upside down. The gospel subverts all our notions of what divine and human power look like. It completely flips on its head all our ideas about salvation and authority and the gospel calls us to trust and to follow the crucified God. This is Jesus in his glory. I've shown you five ironies of the cross from Mark 15. The one who is powerful becomes powerless. The one who is mocked as a false king is the true and divine king. The one crucified as a failed king is the conquering king. And the one who stays up on the cross is the God who has now come down. To wrap things up this morning, because we're in the season of Lent together, I want to simply remind you that our calling as Christians is to be conformed to the likeness of Jesus. You know, when Jesus appears at the end of the age, what the scriptures refer to as the parousia, his coming again in glory, we will experience a kind of glory and a transformation that, well, no eye has seen and no ear has heard and no heart could even conceive of, as Paul writes. But for now, there is a different kind of glory that we are being conformed to. And that's the glory of the cross. 
We're called to a life that is marked by the same kind of ironies, the same kind of upside-downness, the same kind of flipped, subverted sense of power, control, authority that Jesus models for us at Calvary. As the church, we are a people, and I mean church with a capital C, by the way. It applies to us as city church, but the church on the whole. We are a people created and kept by the power of God. And yet the power of God is at work in us and through us in our weakness and in our vulnerability and in our powerlessness. The task of the church is not to assert power, but to become increasingly weak so that the power of God may be revealed and seen, so that the gospel may be seen as the power of God for salvation. Now, the way of Jesus is not a way of upward mobility and aspiration. Unfortunately, false gospels abound that make the gospel that we read of in scriptures somehow coextensive with neat and tidy, like upper middle class aspiration. That's not what the gospel's about. The way of Jesus is the way of downward mobility that ends on a cross, not some upward, mo- upwardly mobile aspirational thing. As the church, we're called to be a people who, like Jesus, endure the ironic mockery of a world that cannot conceive that God's saving power should be entrusted to a people who worship a crucified Jew. We must bear that shame. In 1 Peter, there is a remarkable verse that says, If you suffer for the name of Jesus then the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. I want to say that's exactly what we learn as we read the Gospels, that glory and power belong to being associated with a crucified, suffering king. As a church, we are called to embrace a way that could be defined as losing in order to win. It's the way of the cross. Rather than the way of asserting ourselves and fighting for what we very often mistakenly assume to be our rights, our privileges, some divinely given right to have stuff, to be powerful, to assert ourselves. Friends, the cross turns that all upside down, all of it. As the church, we are called to be people who participate in the way of the cross as a means of others being saved. We must tread carefully here because salvation is God's work. But as a people who are called to worship him and bear witness to him, we get to participate in this way. And I wonder whether the extent to which we seek to hold on to power, to use the gospel for self-serving purposes in aspirational ways. I wonder whether the extent to which we do those things is matched perhaps by our relative powerlessness in reaching others with the message of the gospel. Perhaps the more we try and be powerful and look good and look competent and look like we've got it all together, Perhaps in doing so, we are robbing the gospel of its power by presenting to the world a religious version of what the secular world already thinks is true, i.e. we can save ourselves. Finally, we are called to be a people who face Jesus Christ crucified and who confess him as Lord and King. We didn't mention when talking about the crucifixion scene that the only non-ironic confession of Jesus as king in Mark 15 is on the lips of the Roman centurion who stands facing Jesus. Mark tells us that when the centurion saw how Jesus died, he said, truly this man was God's son. That's a royal confession. 
Truly this man was the king. And I wonder whether the placement of that in Mark 15 hints that the Roman centurion is not just talking about the curtain being torn, and he's not just talking about the different events, but he's thinking about this whole story that has been told. And here at the end, at the climax of it all, the person who says it in non-ironic terms is a non-Jew, is an outsider who by facing Jesus and by seeing him and by understanding that this is Jesus in his glory becomes an insider through his confession. And friends, we are called to be people like that, who stand and face the crucified Jesus, who confess him as king, and who, with God's help, can form our lives to this Christ pattern. This is Jesus in his glory. May you be strengthened and helped by his gracious spirit, the spirit of glory and of God, to walk in his ways this Lenten season, the way of the cross. But not just in this Lenten season, but in all times and in all places, may we be conformed to him, that we may also be glorified with him at his coming. God bless you, City Church. Have a good rest of the day, and I look forward to speaking to you live again in a couple of weeks after a brief interlude with our Easter reflections next week. See you soon.